doing today. Thank you everyone for being here today. And Naomi, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us. Um, many of our members are familiar with your writing. I have read only uh, Clark and Division and I loved it. So we are all eager to hear you talk about your life as a writer and your latest books and anything else that you wanna share with us. So I'll let you take it from here. Yeah, I have a PowerPoint that I want to show you. And it's primarily on um, Clark and Division, my latest historical novel, well, mystery. But afterwards, um, Karen, it's OK to do a Q&A, right? To absolutely, afterwards. absolutely, yeah, we yeah. want that. Yeah. So it's not that long. And then afterwards, if we could just engage, you could ask me any questions about anything about writing the publishing process any you know his, history re research, any questions you may have, and I'd be more than happy to answer them. So let me share my screen right now. Let's see. Okay. So um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. And I'm learning so much about your organization. And since I'm turning 60 this year, I might have to join. <laughs> And I, I think there is a lot of power in um, gathering together. Okay, so this, as I mentioned before, this PowerPoint is centered on um, my latest um, mystery, historical mystery, Clark and Division. And it's actually my first um, historical, which is kind of unusual because I've always, I've written nonfiction books on history. Um, but I my novels up to now have been more contemporary with um, some aspect it's of like a crime that has taken, uh, taken place in the past and like a cold case. And it's up to this contemporary person, maybe an elderly gardener to go and solve the mystery. But um, here, this is the voice of a, a young woman um, in the 1940s. And Clark and the Division, if you uh, don't know what it's about, it's a, on one hand, it's a book about sisterhood. And on the other hand, it's a book about a Japanese American family, the Ito family. Um, and they live in a place called Atwater or Tropical. So I don't know how many of you have heard of this um, neighborhood called Tropical. It was one of the first um, early settlements for Japanese immigrants um, at the turn of the 20th century. There was strawberry farming and it soon, tropical soon uh, changed um, and it, it's the name change and it's located around um, the intersection of Glendale and Los Angeles. It's near where the Tamil Shanter is located in Los Feliz. So that's where my family, the Ito family, um, the, the two parents are Issei or Japanese immigrants from the Kagoshima area. They come here to Tropical and they have two daughters, um, Rose and Aki. And my book is told from Aki's point of view, the younger sister, and she's been in the shadow of her older sister, Rose, her whole life. And they, um, during World War II, they are forcibly moved to um, Manzanar in the Owens Valley, that detention center. And from there, there's an early release program. And Rose, she's in her early 20s, goes to Chicago on her own first. And then Aki and her parents follow um, several months later, only to discover something terrible has befallen Rose. So it's really up to Aki, the younger sister, to find out what happened and to carry her um, immigrant parents through this um, tumultuous period. So that's kind of the gist of the book. Now, as I mentioned, I've written some nonfiction and I co-wrote this with my friend, Heather Linquist, who actually lives in Atwater. Um, and uh, this uh, was for the Manzanar um, uh, Historic National Historic Site, 
um, the, the manager of the bookstore noticed that as people would visit Manzanar, people would ask, well, what happened to people afterwards? So she uh, spearheaded this project and Heather and I were commissioned to work on it. And um, so through the, through this book, I, you know, I had anecdotally known because I, in terms of my friends who are elders, so many of them had been, you know, had siblings who were born in Chicago or had lived in Chicago. And I never really pieced it together. But um, it, uh, you know, I, I then learned through the research that Chicago indeed was the number one destination for Japanese Americans from the 10 mass incarceration camps. Um, both the government and as well as the Quakers just thought, you know, of its location. At the time, it was the second largest city in the United States. Uh, Los Angeles was the third. And because of its location in the Midwest, and it had a lot of defense factories and a lot of work. So um, they, the government really encouraged people, um, especially the Nisei, the ones born in America, to a leave camp to go to uh, Chicago and other places, Detroit, you know, there's a number of locations, Denver, Detroit, um, but Chicago was the largest. Um, before World War II, there was about 400 Japanese Americans who lived there. And by the uh, mid 1940s, there were 20,000. So that just shows you, you know, the exodus and the, you know, um, the just sheer numbers that had gone to Chicago. They didn't necessarily stay. Most people wanted to go back to their homes to the West Coast and did. So this is a particular family. This family had been from, from Sacramento. They were in a place called Tule Lake, a detention center near the Oregon and California border. And then they came to Chicago. And just seeing their faces, you get a sense of, you know, their varied responses to their new home in, in this hostel. Um, so when I was doing research, one thing, you know, and I'm primarily a crime writer, I'm a mystery writer. One piece of one document that was very interesting was from the Resettlers Committee in the mid 1940s. And they were kind of decrying the, um, juven the high level of juvenile delinquency um, a lot because the first people to come from Chicago from the camps were in their mid twenties. You know, all of a sudden they're without parental supervision. They're in one of the no, a very notorious city. So um, it this report stated there were some babies being born out of wedlock. There there were abortions which were illegal at the time and other you know petty crimes and some serious crimes that were happening. I'm not saying this all, you know, this whole population engaged in it, but it wasn't enough so that this uh, resettlers committee was concerned about it. Uh, one group of people, um, these young men, um, they're probably from um, East LA or Boyle Heights. And um, they were wearing, they came to Chicago wearing their zoot suits, which was, you know, popular at the time, the baggy clothes and a baggy shirt and the jacket. And um, one, a professor who was kind of doing research about, you know, the zoot suitors in Chicago couldn't find any photos. And it turns out that she was looking in Chicago when she should have actually gone to people in LA. And this is one of my acquaintances, Janice Tanaka. And she, her um, uncle had, her relatives had been zoot suitors and she came up with these great photos that um, helped me develop one of my characters in the book called Hammer. So how, you know, I was born and raised in, you know, the Pasadena area. Um, I had only, before I decided to work on this project, I had actually gone to Chicago only once. Um, so I guess it took a lot of audacity for me to think that I was gonna write about Chicago. But what I ended up doing was taking two research trips. And one of them was in October, 2017. Luckily, I had um, sources of people, um, com community historians that really, you know, uh, followed who are, who are so 
um, enthusiastic about the history of Japanese Americans in Chicago. And one of them was my friend, Eric Matsunaga. He had even done a Google Maps of all, all the various businesses that had been there in the 1940s and 50s. So he took me through a walking tour of Clark and Division. So Clark and Division is an intersection, a very well-known intersection in Chicago. And um, that was the early way station. That was the early place, that and the south side of Chicago, where these Japanese American young people went. And to tell you the truth, there wasn't much left, but I'm there, that's me on the right photo. And I'm standing, if you read the book, um, you heard about the four story building where the Ito families lived. And this was a similar, it's actually very a beautiful um, doorway, but this was called the LaSalle mansion. And this was one of the, um, the housing units, the apartment buildings where a lot of Japanese Americans lived in the 1940s. So regarding my friend, Eric, if you're really interested in this history and you're on Instagram, he has uh, hit Windy City Nikkei is his, um, his name there. And he posts like different photos from Chicago. And he's also written a lot of articles about this on a, a website called Discover Nikkei. Um, other built, there are a couple structures that are still there. The thing is when uh, the government um, recruited Japanese Americans to go to Chicago, they were dissuading them from creating quote, little Tokyos or Japan towns. They wanted them kind of, you know, to be fully assimilated or kind of erased, you know? So they were saying, you know, do not, uh, congregate in numbers of three or more, which of course was impossible. But I think that's why um, Chicago itself, even though um, they played a big role in this type of resettlement history, you don't see any kind of physical landmarks. But the Mark Twain Hotel, that's where, um, that's in the book if you read it and it's still there. It's like SRO housing and it has a lot of small eateries on the bottom of it. Um, but it had housed um, uh, this uh, beauty shop, Nisei Beauty Shop. Nisei is second generation Japanese Americans um, called the Beauty Box. So I based, there's a real, um, beauty salon that I mentioned in the book, and it's based on this, the beauty box in the Mark Twain. Um, and then in terms of elders that I've learned from, this woman on the left is Sue Kunitomi Embry. Um, she's from Los Angeles. She became an educator, and she was a civil rights activist, and she was a very pivotal in making Manzanar, she was in Manzanar herself, um, making Manzanar a national historic site. And um, she eventually returned to LA. But um, in her oral history, she talks about working at the Newberry Library in Chicago. And again, I was so naive and ignorant. Um, so when Eric was taking me on a tour of, walking tour of Clark and Division, I noticed the Newberry Library was nearby. So I asked to see it. And I had no idea that it was this gorgeous like reference library. And in her oral history, Sue mentions that she had a good experience working there. That was one of her early experiences working in a more interracial kind of workforce. So I think it opened her eyes um, just about different kinds of people. So um, I knew that I had to make the Newberry Library the, the place where my character Aki worked. And it's such a contrast. When I went into the Newberry, I was just thinking, wow, for someone like Sue, you're dealing with the dust of Manzanar, you know, the winds of the Owens Valley. And then you go to this place to work, this gorgeous reference building that's world renowned. You know, I just, that contrast was so interesting to me. And other people said, oh, did you set it in her workplace in a library because it holds all these stories? And I didn't necessarily think about that, but you know, that's a good point. Um, yeah, from there, I just wanted to briefly get into just, I'm sure many of you are writers yourself. 
and just the challenges that that I had to write a character, you know, uh, that was born in the 1920s. Um, and, you know, I had, and then also another challenge was I wrote the second half of it and rewrote the whole book during the pandemic. And on one hand, you know, it may seem, well, you have all this time and you're stuck at home. So, you know, what's the difference? But I, I think for all of us, even though we're at home, you know, safe, but just thinking beyond our walls of our house, there's like, it, you know, there's, there's so much chaos going out there. So it's hard to concentrate. So, um, yeah, so that's the way I kind of built, I mean, in some ways, to understand Aki's experience, because she came from confinement into, you know, a place, an open place like Chicago. And I think as we have gone through different stages of the pandemic, I, you know, I think what resonated with me is once you're outside and things have lifted, it's almost like you're trying to learn how to act normal or, you know, uh, interact with other people. And in that sense, um, I kind of, Aki and I kind of share the same experience. But I did have problems um, with the voice, with Aki's voice in some ways. And my, um, my editor, uh, Juliet Grams at Soho Crime, she really took me to task. And um, this is, so I had to come up with a solution, like how can, basically what Juliet was saying is we need to know this character more, Naomi. You just, you, you don't get into her psyche, you know, it's told in first person. And I think for me, what was hard, I think what I shared in common with Aki is that we're both, um, quote, Nisei, my, my mother's an, an immigrant and my father was born in Watsonville, California, but he was raised in Japan. So anyway, that Japanese culture is pretty strong in me. And I think also with a lot of immigrant kids, we're very protective of our parents. We want to advocate for them. And sometimes um, we push our own feelings down. So we, we're not really sure how we feel. You know, we're more in action mode. So I had to kind of access those parts of Aki and describe it in a way that people would understand. So, oh, okay, and this is, I call this the cigar box because when I was a kid, um, I don't know, I, I, I just thought I had romanticized like having this cigar box and having, you know, at, actually at the Biltmore Hotel, oh, we had this conversation um, before the program started. But when I graduated high school for summer, I worked at the Biltmore Hotel and one of the things we sold were cigars. But I just thought, you know, the cigar box and you put all your treasures in there. So I just, um, these little, um, I'm not much of a drawer, but they put little symbols of things that I had to kind of reckon with as I de developed Aki's voice. Um, so this is, one of the things that my editor um, said I needed to address that I almost never let us into Aki's um, psychology. So this X represents, you know, I had some emotional and cultural blocks within myself, you know, because I think just um, as a child, like growing up in Altadena and being an immigrant kid, you just, you hear like little digs here and there, and you just kind of push it down, right? And I had to kind of address that. So um, so this is one thing that was added. Um, and this is from the book. I looked down at my hands in my lap. I never considered saying how I felt about things. How could I, when I always seemed to be grasping in the darkness to understand where I stood? So this is trying to, you know, get into Aki's psychology, because I think, especially in a society, American society, we're, we're so verbal, you know, we're so oriented to what people say. But for me, um, in my experience, I'm looking, I'm not only listening to people's words, but I'm looking at their body language, 
I'm, I'm listening to what is not being said. And as a result, kind of interpreting that way. Now this, you can't tell what this is. This is supposed to be an hourglass to represent experiences. And then she says, give us a lot more insight into Aki's thoughts and feelings. So um, again, this is related to what I just said. By this time, we understood how the world worked for us. To articulate the attitudes against us would give them power and credence. We prefer to release the pain silently, let it rise in invisible balloons that we couldn't see, but we could feel bumping against our foreheads and shoulders, warning us not to stray too far from what was expected. So um, yeah, the book starts off, um, it, it's not your conventional mystery book because in most mysteries and most mysteries I've written, we have a dead body right in the beginning. But here it was important to me to develop um, Aki's character, her relationship with her sister. So uh, the book actually uh, starts with Aki's birth. So, um, so I think, I, you know, it, I had to kind of show that uh, the way they were raised, what sort of attitudes that people had about them, kind of the, there's a word called microaggressions, the little kind of digs that people would say to them. Um, one of the things is Aki is um, not able to swim at her, this new French um, girl's swimming pool, private swimming pool, because um, the other mothers didn't want their girls to be in the same water as a Japanese girl. So I, I felt I needed to set up those kind of things um, before the outbreak of war to show people that this just didn't happen because of Pearl Harbor, that this was in the works, you know, many decades before that. So after I made my change, I mean, it was hard, you know, so, but it was, it's a happy ending because my editor said it's engrossing, exciting to watch. And these are just like writing tips that I kind of learned was to interview more people. And it, it could, I had to interview my friends about being a younger sister because I'm an older sister. I have no sisters. And I have a brother who's eight and a half years younger than me. So, so it's funny, you know, you don't only interview people about historic things, but just their position in life. And I had to mind my vulnerable moments because there were things that um, I could take from my own life that I could incorporate in Aki's. Refer to other novels, especially the classics. My, my <laughs> editor was going, um, but you need to, you know, uh, be, look at it like Nick Carraway and Great Gatsby and, you know, in terms of how to narrate this book. And I don't, you know, I talked to my girlfriend who's an expert on Great Gatsby. I don't think it really helped or anything, but it was fun to do that. And just be aware of your emotional and cultural blocks. So, um, yeah, so what's next? Um, I, you know, I didn't talk about my Gardner book, uh, my Maserai books, but I've written seven of them. And it's actually a gardener who lives in Altadena who solves crimes. And he's also an atomic bomb survivor, which uh, mirrors my father's own experience. And uh, the last book is Hiroshima Boy. And that was released in Japan um, last August. And on the right, um, I also do, you know, I talked about contemporary mysteries and this is one set in Kauai, um, Leilani Santiago and Internal Lay, and that's coming up in March. And then, um, oh, and then I'm also working on um, a follow-up to Clark and Division. Um, this new book is gonna be called Evergreen and it's gonna be set in Los Angeles. And um, Evergreen, um, it's a street, it refers to an actual street in Boyle Heights. So um, Aki will be moved uh, from Chicago, she'll be moving to Boyle Heights in Los Angeles. And this particular photograph really um, moved me. Um, and it was, we found it, we couldn't incorporate it in, um, our nonfiction book, but for some reason, this a photo kind of helped 
set the tone of Clark and Division, even though it was, this is in LA. But I thought this photo was so interesting because it's so it's very different than the government photos because everything is so chaotic. The, you know, there's a bit of a mess, right? There's a pan on the floor and then there's a newspaper that might, that's probably the Rafu Shinpo newspaper, the Japanese American newspaper that I eventually worked for. And just the, there's of course no room for these dresses to be, you know, no closet. So they're just hanging on the wall. And I think um, this probably exemplified kind of um, what these, um, these families faced when they were after being released from camp. So that this photo was um, very important in that way. So um, anyway, I'll stop sharing and I'll take your questions. I don't know how, Katie, how do you want to handle this part of it? Um, Karen, do you mind if I take it from here? You want to, okay, you're muted, but what? Um, yeah, yeah, take okay. it from here. Uh, thank you so much, Naomi. Wow, it was Let's wonderful. Around applause and thanks for sharing your insights. Um, so we just opened the floor for questions um, and comments, and I hope I hope we can get the conversation rolling. I, I I fortunately just finished the book, and I so enjoyed it. And I have to say, um, I'll, I'll just start with a question, if you don't mind. Um, you know, I I wondered, you know, was it encouraged for the Japanese Americans to stay in Chicago? Was that the idea of the plan? Were they discouraged from moving back to their hometowns um, in California or, um, and then, how, you know, do you have any idea how many of them stayed and how many said, no, I want to go back home? I think, I'm, and then we have um, some folks, anyone in the audience actually part of the, the Japanese American exodus um, and have experience living in some, some other state and then returning back? I mean, if you do like, you know, so, yeah. you know, wave your hands. Okay. Oh, when, you know, I think you, you all should maybe, I, I, I can comment on this too, but Wendy, can you say anything about your own experience? And I guess the Yaguras, if you could, if you don't mind, because you actually experienced it. <laughs> so thank you very much, Naomi. Thank you for a really fascinating presentation. I'm so impressed with how prolific you have been as an author, that really impressive. So my own family's experience was going from the Fresno Fairgrounds um, to Jerome, which was the most distant, you know, it was in a, one of two camps in Arkansas. And so as Jerome was the last camp to be built and the first to close. My parents were newlyweds and my older sister was born in under incarceration. And my father was afraid that he would not be able to find employment if he returned to California. Also, he would have to wait. And he was told that there were jobs in the Midwest. But unlike, you know, you, as you said, the largest resettlement was in Chicago. He went to Cleveland, Ohio. Mm. And he remained in Cleveland for the remainder of his life. He, he lived until he was 85 years old. And he and my mother made their permanent home, Cleveland, Ohio, and raised the family there where we were the only non-white family in an all white suburb of Cleveland. And, you know, he was active in JACL. I, uh, I didn't know very much about what it meant to be part of a JA community, but the thought never entered my parents' mind to want to return to California because they felt that they had turned a page and they were afraid of what discrimination they could face in California. And instead they were willing to face the uncertainty and the unknown of building this whole new life in Cleveland, Ohio. Mm. Wow. Do you know the Ibihara family? Have you I heard of them? No, I don't. Most people want to know if I knew um, <laughs> Hank Tanaka. And of course, we knew Hank Tanaka very well in Cleveland. But no, I didn't know the Itaharas. We oh, live on the west side of Cleveland. Oh, OK. Um, yep. Ibi, Ibihara. He, Wataru, he works for the Little Tokyo Service Center. But he's, yeah, he's, his family's from Cleveland. How about the Yaguras? Did you want to add anything or say anything? And you're muted right now. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So we were in both different camps. I do have to ask a question though. Is, is Eric Matsunaga uh, the son of Andy and 
Joanne Matsunaga in who live in the Ventura area? No, no. they live in they live in Chicago. Chicago. Okay. And, and Eric is Hapa, so oh, his uh, his mother is white. Oh, okay. I think Polish. Yeah. Well, uh, our family also went to the Fresno relocation camp from uh, Madeira and Sanger, right around the Central Cal. And then we were shipped to a post in Arizona. Uh, our family was split. Half part of our family went to post in Arizona. The other half went to Jerome, Arkansas, eventually. And ultimately, we ended up in Jerome. And then we ended. And then towards the end of the war, uh, there weren't enough men to harvest crops, so uh, <laughs> father was the sent to Caldwell, Idaho, near the Minidoka camp, uh, where he harvested potatoes and stuff like that for the uh, war effort. And then we ended up back in uh, the Sanger area after uh, we got out of Idaho. But uh, I had aunts and uncles who all went to uh, Chicago uh, on both sides of the, of the family and uh, ended up living, well, some of them stayed in Chicago and others came back to Sacramento and other places uh, in California or the Southwest. Terry has a different st story. Yes, um, I was born in Santa Anita uh, my parents were newlyweds, and so the family was split. Um, my mother and father were sent. They, they married straight out of high school when the war uh, broke out. Um, and so they were sent to Heart Mountain, um, Wyoming. Wyoming. And then after when he uh, then volunteered for the Army, um, my mother then was shipped to Manzanar, where the rest of her family, her siblings and uh, her, her parents were. And so we ended up in Manzanar. Um, and from there, you know, I, I have no recollection actually of any of the camp experience. But her family was, it lived near USC before they were sent to San Diego Racetrack right. where she was born. And, right. and then they ended up back there, uh, just about two miles away from USC. Yes. I, I started in the Fresno area, ended up in the Fresno area after Idaho, but then we moved to near South Central Los Angeles, near downtown LA, in a primarily African-American neighborhood, because in those days you could really only live in an African-American neighborhood, uh, in a Mexican-American neighborhood, or out in Gardena Torrance, which is way out in the boonies uh, when we got out of camp. But I ended up growing up in Boyle Heights in East LA. So I'm very familiar with Evergreen and in that area. And for us, um, our family, my uh, grandfather was able to buy a house uh, through, I guess it was my uncle because he was American citizen. So he, he bought the house um, a couple miles away from USC. Um, and while we were in camp, apparently uh, an African-American family uh, lived in our house and they lived there the whole time. And so the house was saved in a sense. Um, and when we got out of camp, I, this I do remember is that we lived with them. Uh, I think it was a very small house uh, for two families, uh, maybe two, I think maybe even just two bedrooms at the time. And so we lived with them until they were able to find another place to live. Mm. And um, then um, they left me with their cat. So that I was so happy with. <laughs> that's a great, that's a great, what was the cat's name? Do you remember? No, I just called it Kitty because there was no <laughs> name. I didn't know and the cat responded and stayed, you know, for like 19, 20 years. Oh, wow. That's a great story. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, it is. Um, yeah, Katie, too. I mean, I, I'm I, it, it just said that most people did return to the West Coast. I imagine that some of it might be just the weather, like, you know, people were not, you know, really prepared for all that, you know, the winter time. Um, I think, you know, it, it's just that, uh, but, but there are cases just as um, Wendy had mentioned, I mean, even Eric Matsunaga, my guide, um, his mother just felt, not mother, his grandmother felt 
there are more opportunities in Chicago, in the Midwest than California. So, you know, I, I think this project has made me think because I think here in California, we think we're, we're more progressive or open, but, you know, actually, um, California, you know, was the place where there was a lot of anti-Asian, you know, laws, anti, you know, um, from buying land, from mis, you know, miscegenate, you know, against intermarriage. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas in Chicago, a place like Illinois, you know, they were much more open, and there are much more cases of, uh, of like Japanese people uh, being married to like whites. You know, and you, you, that was a no-no here in California. So um, I think what I tried, attempted to do in Clark and Division is show there's a number of different characters and everyone has a different take about it. Um, you know, one character just thinks Chicago's the best. There's, you know, and, and um, Aki's uh, love interest, um, um, Art Nakasone is actually from Chicago. And so he, he himself, his family, they don't, they didn't have to be removed, you know, so life continued as usual. So that was another contrast um, from Aki's point of view, just to think of everything that her own family had gone through yet with Art, you know, they have all their pets and their nice dishes and the great food and like nothing had, you know, really changed for them. I don't want to, to dominate these questions, the question and answer period. Yeah. I, I do have a comment, uh, which is uh, you mentioned the difficulty of getting over the emotional and cultural blocks uh, to writing it. And I understand that. And I really congratulate you for getting beyond that. Um, one of Terry's distant cousins uh, came from Kyoto and interviewed us for the Kyoto Shimbun newspaper, one of the big newspapers there about uh, her family's um, history, because he's part of that family, a distant relative of her mother's side. And um, what um, uh, I discovered is he asked two questions that really opened my eyes. He said uh, something to the effect, he asked something to the effect of, how, do you, how did you feel when you were young about what happened to your family? And then how do you feel now about what happened to your family? And what I realized is that something that's been bothering me all year with all the anti-Asian rhetoric and violent crimes that have been committed is that you can compartmentalize what happened to you when you were younger. And, and, and that doesn't seem to add to what you are feeling and what you've experienced uh, today, even if it was a threat like I had you know, a number of months ago. And um, I, I think it's hard to get beyond the plus, as you say, how you were raised by your Nisei parents versus, you know, the, 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 the generation that we grew up in the Sanseis where we were pretty free and able to do anything we wanted to do because we, we didn't have to behave properly uh, in a camp because we were safe there and our, our parents and grandparents really couldn't do too much to us, so. <laughs> yeah, um, I think that's why too, in terms of, um, because some people ask, well, why, why mystery? You know, why a crime? Um, and I think that it raises the stakes for the Ito family. I think without this big loss and um, Aki, you know, determined to find out what happened to her sister, um, she would probably compartmentalize her own experience because there was so much pressure, like, look forward, be optimistic, you know, which are good things. That's how you survive. But on the other hand, you're kind of um, forgetting this, uh, this actual experience that made such a big impact on you. And, you know, and as more time passes, it may be, I mean, it's still a part of your DNA. I think it's still there, but it might be harder for you to kind of access and kind of pull it out and to really see how big an impact it might make on you. But I, I've even heard that, um, and what's interesting is younger people, younger generations, you know, people who are, you know, fourth gener, maybe their grandparents or great grandparents rather had this experience and they still um, innately feel something 
they feel something is kind of off or missing, or there's kind of a void. Something's been broken, you know, in terms of their own family history. So I'm finding, you know, I think that's why this is a good time to write about it because I'm a ju former journalist and historian and oral history. I, I kind of want to honor the, the real stories of people, but now, unfortunately, that generation is pretty much gone for the most part. And so now I feel like um, fiction writers can come in and we can fill in the blanks and kind of imagine, you know, connect the dots. And I think this is beneficial to like younger people because I'm finding that they're kind of thirsty to imagine what might have happened to um, their ancestors. Do we have any questions? You're welcome to raise your hand. Uh, yeah, Barbara. Um, yes, Naomi, thank you so much for uh, the book. I have enjoyed your book so much. Um, what this book, told me is how little I know about that history because I what what I knew was that there was the incarceration. I had no idea that people were invited to or sent to big cities in the east. My question is were was this like an invitation anybody could ask for it or individuals were picked out and were given the opportunity um how did that how did that work um there was um there was one um national i can't remember the proper title but there was one council that um helped to place nisei um, at universities so that was uh, an act and a lot of these organizations like the quakers were practically the only group that really helped japanese the outs outside group that helped Japanese Americans and many um, of these organizations were supported by them. So um, they, so many Nisei from camp, they went, in, went into schools in the Midwest and East Coast. Um, of course, there was um, many times there were quotas, so you couldn't have too many going to one school, but, um, but that was, uh, the bewildering experience for some Nisei because they're the only you know Japanese in this one town and and people don't know, quite know it wasn't like the, anyone was hateful but they were trying to figure out are they Chinese who are the you know who is this person kind of thing but, but um, the process would be that someone it in the would, would would learn that there was the opportunity to go to university, for instance. Yeah. yeah. And there was another controversial thing that happened, and it was more related to the um, uh, the drafting of, of Japanese Americans in, into the military was they had to answer this loyalty oath, you know, so it, it couldn't be just any person who wanted out could go. You know, there was some, you had to answer the in the correct way in terms of the loyalty oath and they would kind of check you out to see if and 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 also what um many times in the early times you needed some kind of sponsor or there was some kind of work opportunity i think um ken mentioned like there was like a lot of um, farms that needed temporary workers so you know you would have to kind of go through this process of being vet, vetted at a very you know base level in order to be released to do these quote opportunities, you would have to carry around um, some kind of special ID, you know, after you were released, and it really depended on um, the city or community, you know, how you know you were supposed to like a report. There were these war relocation authority offices. And you had to kind of report to them and say you're here in the town and they were you know supposedly supposed to keep tabs on you while you were in that particular city but it, it really depended it you know i think in terms of the enforcement of that um was not uniform uh i wanted to make a point that um i come from a quaker camp family from swarthmore pennsylvania and i know that eleanor roosevelt asked the quakers to help the college age kids in the camps get into colleges. 
and several thousand got into colleges. A lot of them were Quaker colleges, but other colleges also. But for some reason, I don't know exactly why, and my parents aren't around to ask, a, a Japanese American family named the Izumis lived in our house with us for my brother and sister and I can't remember a few months or a year or two. They lived on the third floor. We had a big uh, sort of East Coast house and they lived on the third floor. They had two children and um, they ended up staying in Swarthmore and he became the music, the piano music teacher for the whole town. Hmm. And his wife started a small business where she made dresses and I know they stayed there, but I, and I don't know why they lived with us. I think a family had to sponsor certain people to get them out of the camp or something like that. Yeah, that is true. And it's kind of similar to like refugees, right? Who come to this country yeah. and many times like church communities will agree to sponsor, you know, a family. So that was at work as well. Um, that kind of um, sponsorship in someone's home. Well, we thought it was fantastic. It was such a neat family and the kids were a little older than us and they could babysit for us. And we just had a wonderful time with them. Maybe that was the reason. Your parents. <laughs> that could have been the understanding. <laughs> I see Esther's yeah. hand and then Dick, Esther. Oh, you're muted. Oh. Still me. Okay. Naomi, thank you. This was remarkable. Just so wonderful. It's for me personally filled in some blanks in my own history. The Uehara family was released from a camp, I believe, in the Dakotas or Idaho. Uh, and they came to Toledo, Ohio, because Mercy Hospital sponsored Mr. Uehara, who had learned to cook while he was in camp. And he became the chief chef in Mercy Hospital. And um, I met his daughter, Rose, in high school. We were friends then, we were friends in college. We are friends to this day, but one of the greatest influences in my life was Rose Uehara. When we were in college, she said, let's take a trip, let's go to Chicago. Chicago was our destination so many times when, when we took a break from college. It was a wonderful city, but it was wonderful people. I had no idea about why they were in Chicago, but she had family in Chicago. In about 1960, her family that was still in Toledo decided they were going home and they moved back to California. And Rose stayed in Toledo to finish her college years. And when she went back home, I went to visit. I ended up in Boyle Heights. Mm -hmm. That's where the family lived. They were running a grocery store in that community. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing that has always disturbed me is that I was 28 years old before I ever heard about the detention of the Japanese in this country. And yet I was with that family all of those years. Um, it was just a remarkable thing that I didn't hear any talk about it until at least the 1970s, when the younger Oiharas began talking about it. Just amazing, but, but I didn't know why I went to these places. Chicago, right. Boyle yeah. Heights, right. it fills in some blanks. Yeah, now it's, yeah. And a, a lot of these things were not spoken of until like the 1980s during the redress and reparations movement. And that bill was eventually signed by President Reagan. But as part of that whole campaign, if you remember, were these hearings that they had all across the nation. And, you know, and uh, it was very emotional for people because this is like, and some of them were Japanese, they were Issei, you know, this is the first time they actually spoke about their experience. And, and um, it was very emotional, you know, grown men were crying, you know, and um, so I think it, that's the whole thing, you know, we talked about compartmentalizing, you know, we're trying to, you know, go, you know, we could all relate. We're trying to do that with the pandemic, right? We don't want to be, you know, we want to kind of put it aside too, but, you know, so, but it's really interesting. Remarkable. Remarkable. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, Dick, go ahead. 
I have, I have two questions. One is I noticed the uh, Hara in the name Hiro Hara, and I heard Ito Hara, and I heard another Hara, Japanese name ending in Hara, and I'm wondering what role Hara plays in the Japanese naming. And uh, the second question is, I uh, yesterday I listened to a conversation with two Black women talking about their experience of growing up, and they both brought up the when and how they learned that they were Black. And I'm wondering if there's any resonance in that with the Japanese experience in, in coming out of the incarceration. And is, is there any kind of resonance of discovering that you're Black or in, and I'm sure you always knew you were Japanese, but that's not necessarily that you're different. And is there any kind of correspondence with the, with the Japanese experience to what I learned about the Black experience? Well, I'm gonna answer your first question and I would like, um, the other Japanese Americans on this Zoom to respond to your second one. Um, but um, yeah, so it, it's kind of interesting with surnames and, the, uh, and Jap Japanese history because I think for a long time, the Japanese, I don't know how this works, but they didn't have surnames. They didn't have, I don't know how you could not have a surname, but. Then there, there came in a certain time in Japanese history where people could have surnames. So they just pick things. Most of them are related to nature. You know, most Japanese surnames are, you know, uh, refers to some kind of agricultural thing. So Hara means valley. Hara is valley. So, and then Hira, my name, um, it, it means flat. So flat valley <laughs> that's basically but if you you know need anybody you know any of these haras it's valley that's what it's from and then i, I want to pose this question to the other japanese americans i mean let, let's start with wendy since you lived in a predominantly well maybe you knew immediately that you're different but when did it it occur to you that you were well, oh, different. <laughs> I think Dick's question was very interesting because in my own experience, it had a dual nature. So during my entire childhood, I knew that I was different just from looking in the mirror. And I also experienced um, some painful discriminatory conduct when I was a child, everything from being called, you know, names on the playground to as I got to my more social years, I had friends who were permitted to be my friend, but not permitted to date me, for example. And that was confusing and it was hurtful. So I knew that I was different, but I didn't really understand what it meant to be Asian and especially Japanese American until I moved to San Francisco. Um, when I finished, I went to law school in Philadelphia. So again, a very East Coast experience. And I know Swarthmore, um, Betty Ann very well. I moved to San Francisco in 1979. And I always say that's when I discovered truly discovered that I was Asian and Japanese American because it was the late seventies and the Asian law caucus was really, you know, the, the, the people who had gone to Berkeley and Stanford and had much more of a social consciousness than I had ever had as a Midwesterner um, had such a profound impact on me. I met Dale Minami and all the attorneys who would eventually work on the Coram Nobis cases to write the injustice of the Korematsu Hirabayashi um, and, um, um, I'm blanking on the third name, but the Supreme Court cases that arose from the wartime incarceration. And I was just so impressed and emotionally sort of overwhelmed by what my peers as Sansei young attorneys were doing, um, things that had never even entered my consciousness as a Midwesterner. So yes, I knew I was different as a child, but I really began to develop my identity as a young adult by moving to California. You know, we haven't heard from Shizuko. Did you ever feel, yeah, how well, would you respond to this question? Well, um, I was born in Long Beach and um, uh, the area, dad had his import export business right there where the Long Beach Pike used to be, which we can't find anymore now. But anyway, the place we lived and the place the businesses was very, um, non-Asian, it was other, white mostly. And so when I went to elementary school in Long Beach, there it was, I was, there were only two Japanese families in that school. So 
we dad was a very very gregarious you know friendly kind of and so everybody his uncle came over for dinner which made my mother kind of surprised but that's how she greeted everybody so i was mixed always with friends that were not asian and so i was just used to others i guess but i didn't know they were others they were just part of me so when we were sent to santa anita which was you know the first place they put us in because camps weren't built at that time my sisters and my brother we looked at each other and you know it's all this other whatever we're looking at we said oh my god where are they all coming from when that's when we recognized we were something different so i had kind of a reverse um transition so all through camp i you know we were all with obviously all the japanese and so um that identity like dick was i think was referring to reverse but i was a, another different kind of reverse in terms of how my awareness was so i was very proud that um and then we went to you know we went to jerome like the two of you had been Ken and Wendy, you went to Jerome. Um, and then they closed that and uh, because to a German prisoner camp or something like that. And then we were shipped to Arizona. And then um, Arizona uh, at uh, Gila Camp One. And then from Gila, um, that's when I could still remember the day that the radio said the war is ended. And I ran out outside the bungalow and I said, the radio just said the war has ended. What does that mean? <laughs> and it was dead quiet out there. And mm -hmm. then somebody, I heard a voice say, I guess we just have to wait and see. And so then I noticed as I was looking up, you know, the military watchtowers, the military disappeared. And so, but so we observed a lot of those kinds of things. And I was what, seven years old, eight years old. Anyway, so we, dad always wanted to come to a big city and all these invitations of different people saying, you know, go here, go there. Dad never took those. And he wanted to come back to California. So he got a bus and he loaded as many families that he could on this bus. And he said, I'm going to California. So as many as we could fit, we're going to trek back to California. So dad was a mover and he got the people back to California. And then we found a gymnasium behind a church right outside of Sacramento called Florin, the city. And dad asked the minister if we could borrow the gymnasium. So dad separated the gymnasium with blankets and the families lived within the partitions of blankets. And the men built a Japanese bathtub outside. So we all took baths outside. And there was a small kitchen in the gym. So, but gradually all the families went back to wherever they wanted to go in California. And dad came to Los Angeles, a big city. He didn't want to go back to Long Beach. He came to LA and um, found our apartment in good old Boyle Heights, the best place you could have been born and raised because it was such a mix of everybody so my identity as a as an asian or japanese american was evident after i got into santa anita so i knew who i was i knew who my i wasn't you know an angle i was a asian so that's a, a, a reverse kind of a thing but mia and then i'm going to ask harry and jane afterwards Yeah, yeah. So, oh, you're muted, Mia. Oh, yeah. Linda, I'll get to you in a sec. You got to unmute yeah. here. You, Mia, you got to unmute. Okay. So, Shiz, uh, Shizzy. Uh huh. Were were those people who returned to California? Do you know uh -huh. how, how? Do you know how many of them were able to reclaim their original properties that were taken from them? You know, I don't think dad kept in touch with them because, you know, um, but I know my dad couldn't, you know, and he didn't want to go back to his own business because he had three children and it was such a gamble because of 
well, the discrimination that kept, you know, going at that time. So he did all the a college grad from Japan and America. I mean, he did the typical, you know, gardening and all that, which is not his speed. Um, and I'm sure the way he died young, and I am sure because you've heard the, they never talked about the war, never, never, never talked about that with us. And I'm sure he kept it all in. And that's what I'm sure took his life. So um, oh, yeah, no, dad never, never got his property back. Yeah. I often wondered in our history classes, uh, we were taught all about the internment camps and um, most of our teachers, uh, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay area and most of our teach, well, all of our teachers, uh, our male teachers had been in the war. And so they, a lot of them talk very openly about it, but I always wondered when the Japanese who were allowed to move from the, their internment camps and join the US military, and then they went to Europe and at the point of the liberation of the Jews from their concentration camps, I often wondered what, was, what had to be going on in the minds of our Japanese soldiers, our Japanese American soldiers, who were liberating people, you know, because of the, because of the Holocaust. And I was just wondering if, if there has been any writings about, about that. I know the, the, the Jews, of course, were, were dumbfounded. They were so confused because they had no idea that Japanese Americans were fighting on the side of the Americans. I mean, they, they, they didn't know all the, the history and in the internment camps that we had here. Uh, and so they were petrified when they saw so, some of these people coming in, or not petrified, I guess they were, uh, we saw films of this. They spared us nothing in our history classes. We saw a lot, probably more than we should have been shown at, at uh, that young age, but uh, we, saw that we saw a lot of the deaths that the, in term, the uh, incinerators, the whole business. And, uh, but I just, I just uh, the, the look of surprise, I mean, they just, they just couldn't figure out, you know, who would come to liberate them. Um, and I just wondered if there was any knowledge of writings about this, the Japanese Americans, how they felt about fighting with the US in, in the European theater. Um, let's leave that question, Linda's question for just a minute and go to Mia and then we'll come back to it. Go ahead, Mia. I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> oh, when did you figure out your Japanese? <laughs> or Asian. I, I will say this about Clark and Division, that um, <clears throat> I had two uncles from Hawaii who were part of the 442 and they fought in Europe and they were Japanese Americans fighting on behalf of the Americans. And uh, they relocated to Chicago. As a matter of fact, they relocated both of them, two uncles from the 442 and they raised their families in Chicago. And they um, eventually went back to Hawaii. But, but when I was in the army in Chicago, <clears throat> I used to stay with them on, on the weekends when I'd get a weekend pass and that kind of a thing. And they introduced me to a lot of the displaced Japanese American culture that, um, that grew up there after the war. So I learned a little bit about it. And I certainly enjoyed Park and Division from that perspective, knowing a little bit about the JA community over there in Chicago. They had a, a rich religious community, both Buddhist and Christian. Um, they maintained a lot of the, the cuisine and that kind of a thing. And um, <clears throat> My aunt, who was Okinawan, really definitely worked very hard to preserve Okinawan culture in um, Chicago. So there was a great deal of Japanese American culture and community over there that uh, was great to tap into when I was in the army. I might just see this also. My dad was offered, my dad was a lawyer, I went into camp and um, was offered work in both Chicago and New York. And uh, he turned it down. He didn't want to go back there. He had a very obstinate, point of definitely coming back to where he had been taken from. That was something that was, there was no alternative to that. He was going back to Los Angeles and there was nothing going to stop him. So that was pretty much the nature of it. And um, I will say this, I don't remember anything about camp, by the way, either. I left there when I was two years old. I was born in Poston. Um, and um, I couldn't tell you anything about it, but I could tell you a little bit about the resettlement. Coming back, the people that wanted us gone in the first place 
really didn't want us coming back. And there was quite a bit of resistance to the Japanese American resettlement right here in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was a segregated community for many, many years after the war. I went to a Japanese American grammar school. My mother worked as a nurse in the uh, Japanese hospital. My dad was a lawyer by the corner of San Pedro and First Street in Japanese town. So we were cloistered. And I think there was an element uh, when you talk about integration and that type of thing, that communities that come from foreign countries and that kind of a thing have a tendency to self-segregate a little bit, just so we can share language, culture, and cuisine uh, and not have somebody um, wondering about us or making fun of us. So that was I, just in a nutshell, a little bit of our return to Los Angeles and uh, coming back from the camps. Uh, to respond to Linda's question, um, yeah, so the, um, the military unit that was uh, uh, participated, I, 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 I guess the proper term is um, the Dachau subcamp. So they helped to liberate, not necessarily Dachau, but I guess there were these smaller, terrible, you know, concentration, you know, death camps. Yeah. Um, there. And so the um, artillery within the main 100th 442nd regimental combat team was this other unit. It was the artillery battalion. So they're the ones that would send, you know, um, send out the, the, the cannons or whatever, the other kinds of large artillery units to um, fight against um, the the enemy in Europe and they were the ones and you know I think what for me you know when I worked at the Japanese American newspaper what was very touching was they had reunions of um, these kind of the uh, liberators you know with um, the Jewish um, people who had survived the death camps and just to see that was so touching, you know, they'd be, they didn't know each other, but there were embraces. Mm -hmm. And then on the, the, the Jewish, um, you know, uh, uh, former captives, you know, they had the, they had the tattoos, right, you know, on their hands. And, and it was just like really um, touching to see that. Um, I haven't heard to tell you the truth uh, that much of the soldiers being really cognizant at the time that, okay, we are gonna free, you know, help the Jews who are in camps, just like our, our relative, you know, our loved ones are in camps. I think uh, what I've seen, and my own father-in-law was part of that military unit. I, I think it was more like a duty based. Well, we're Americans, so this is what we need to do. You know, we're drafted, so this is what we need to do. Um, I think maybe when more time elapsed and they became more reflective, maybe people started to make those connections a little more later. But um, there's, a, there's a book called Unlikely Liberators. Um, th there's a few books about um, those military units. And um, yeah, so that's one I could, I can recommend. Okay. Unlikely liberators, right? I, I believe that's, yeah. Harry and Jane, did you want to say anything about any part of this program? Thank you, Naomi. It was great. We enjoyed your book very much. Um, interestingly, I was born in Watsonville, where you have family roots as well. And um, uh, my family uh, went to, I'm sorry, I was away for a few minutes, so I'm not sure where we are in the thread. But we're of kind of, I think we're kind of wrapping it up, but I just wanted to give okay. you an opportunity to say something. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was two and a half when our family was ordered to go to uh, a concentration camp. And we first went to the Salinas Fairgrounds uh, which was euphemistically called an assembly center while the camps were being built. And then my family went to post in Arizona. Um, my father, who was a farmer, did not go back. We did not go back to Watsonville. Uh, we learned that we could leave early 
from Poston if we had a place to go. Uh, we had a friend who owned a ranch in Eastern Oregon on the Snake River and that was outside the military zone. And so we, my father accepted an invitation to farm with his friend in, um, in a place called Ontario, Oregon, uh, right on the border between Idaho and Oregon. And it wasn't until the mid fifties that we returned to Watsonville. And Naomi, one of my best friends in high school was Mieko Hirahara, yeah. who is your father's cousin, I believe. Um, but anyway, that's that was our history in terms of camp. And Harry's family went from the Bay Area to Topaz in Utah uh, before returning to, to the Bay Area again. And speaking of Chicago and cities in the Midwest, I have one cousin who was born in Chicago because his parents went from Poston to Chicago and another cousin who went, who was born in Cleveland, Ohio, because her parents went from Poston to Cleveland. So our family history mirrors some of the things that we've been talking about today. You wanna add anything to that? Chicago played a part in my, my family as well. Uh, we were in Topaz, Central Utah in German camp, and with, I had three sisters who went to Chicago, and they were there. They worked and went to school, so Chicago played a real part uh, in the development of the uh, Kawahara family. So I'm uh, remembering some of those stories that I heard from my sisters about their experiences in the was what was then called a windy city. So it was that they were very uh, so pleasantly welcoming to some of the Japanese Americans who in cars, who were uh, liberated there in, uh, in Chicago. So it was a real part of the Japanese American history during World War II. And what kind of valley is Kawahari? Kawahara. <laughs> what kind of I'm sorry. What kind of valley is that? <laughs> what kind of valley is Kawahara? Kawa means river, I believe, right? Right. Uh, it's so, river by the field. River by the field. My my fam my family name is Yamaguchi, which means Yama is mountain, as in Fujiyama. And Guchi, I think, means literally means mouse, Kuchi. So I imagine that it might be a cave in the mountain, side of the mountain. Oh, <laughs> Naomi mentioned they were nature related. Most of our names are nature related. Interesting. Uh -huh. Well, are there any more uh, comments or questions from our audience? I just wanted to say that I'm not a writer and I love Naomi the way you talked about how you develop characters and how you write these books. I think it's really fascinating. Yeah, very fascinating. You know, I not only want to thank Naomi for this incredible presentation, a slice of American history that we do not know enough about. And I want to thank everyone in the audience who contributed to this really rich conversation my first friend as a child, when I spoke nothing but Danish, was a Japanese girl who spoke nothing but Japanese. <laughs> and uh, our parents were bilingual. But I remember in Altadena, the prejudice against Japanese. And I, I look back now as an adult and think how beautiful that our parents, my parents and her parents, could bridge that gap so beautifully. And my sister and I, and she and her sister were the same ages and we all learned to speak English together. And it was a beautiful experience. Mm -hmm. I've always loved things Japanese and I learned so much in reading uh, Clark and Division. Little things came back to me in reading that book. So I thank you so much for that. I wanna read more of your books. I really wanna read Life After Manzanar. We did, our, our village did take a trip to Manzanar about 
it was probably about five years ago and it was a really rich trip. It was amazing, wasn't it? it was. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I had just joined and I got to know, we took a weekend trip up there and I got to know so many members really well and it was uh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Naomi. And Naomi, Naomi, let me be the first to welcome you to the village in anticipation of the day you decide to join. <laughs> I, I think I need to join. I've, I've been very aware that cognitively I need to keep my mind. You know, I, Sharp. I wasn't old enough to join the village. And then I, I finally did. And I realized, oh, this is wonderful. So uh, the village is made up of people who are very busy just like you so this is don't worry about being busy you, you have to be 60 be is 60 the minimal yeah. 55 oh is it 60 okay 55 okay oh, it's 55 oh just like arp okay yeah yeah <laughs> that's right <laughs> yeah very, very yeah. eligible naomi yeah. eligible in many that. many 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 ways so yeah. Part of the family. Naomi, I want to thank you very much for your presentation. It was wonderful. Oh, oh thank you. Thank you for having me. And, I, and thanks to all who shared from their own lives, because I think it yeah. makes the conversation so much richer. So it, I it thank was you wonderful. for that. Yeah. Naomi, can yeah. I just ask, um, when is your next book, Evergreen, coming out? It's due in... Um, March, you said. Well, actually, April. April. Oh. Okay. Yeah, my, my uh, Hawaii book's coming out in March, but I have to turn, I'm writing it right now. And oh. then um, it probably won't come out until next year. Evergreen? Oh. Yeah, Evergreen won't come out until next year. And that follows um, the characters from Clark and Division. Exactly. I so, really want to read awesome. that. And maybe in our next presentation with you, you'll, you'll be a member. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true, true. And, and this, this actually, I want everyone to know, this was a joint presentation of the Inclusivity Committee and the Cultural Committee. And uh, thank you so much again, Naomi.